Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this edition of the SMP Power Hour. This is actually our inaugural uh, run at this. My name is Ryan Coyman, I'm the Director of Training, and I'm here with Peter McCardle, our master trainer in-house. He's going to be the one doing the presentation today about blower motors and blower motor resistors. A lot of great information on tap here, uh, so I'm going to keep this short. But we want to welcome you to this. Feel free to open up the Q&A section and type any questions you might have there. We'll pass them along to Peter at certain times throughout. And uh, again, got a lot of great information here. This is actually one little excerpt of some of our classes we do. We've got a great lineup of trainers, great lineup of topics and classes that we do all throughout North America on any given night or virtually here in the studio. So if you like what you see, we encourage you to reach out to your local parts house for more information. We're also an ASE accredited training provider. And you can see our mission statement here on the screen. That's something that really bodes to the heart of everything we do when it comes to training here. So that being said, I'm gonna turn it over to Peter. Take it away. Thank you, Ryan. Um, so we've only got a half hour here. We've got a lot to cover. So we're gonna get right on the way. Um, so the basic outline of what we're going to talk about, blow motor service challenges. Uh, you know, on paper, a lot of folks think, look at a blow motor schematic, it looks pretty simple and straightforward. But when you look behind the curtain, it can be quite complicated. There are quite a few things to be taken into account for a successful blow motor or resistor replacement. Uh, we'll discuss the different types of blow motor circuits, uh, resistive pulse with modulated brushes and so on. And we're going to specifically talk, spend a little time talking about brushless motor technology. That's the kind of the latest, greatest thing in, in blow motors. And then we we'll actually have some, uh, we've got some uh, a demonstration board here with some actual good and broken blower motors. We're going to look at some waveforms, oscilloscope waveforms, so you get a sense of what to look out for if you're trying to diagnose an intermittent type of problem with the blower motor circuit. And we will wrap the session up with some blower motor and resistor insulation tips. So first thing I want to emphasize to you here is, uh, you know, oftentimes we don't recognize how how much work a blower motor circuit is doing. If you look at the whole vehicle, uh, the blower motor is probably in the top three components in terms of electrical work being done. In other words, in the context of the, the wattage of the circuit. So if you do some simple Ohm's law math here, 14 volts, 25 amps, I see a lot of blower motors between 15 and 30 amps, let's say, uh, 25 amps, that's a 350 watt circuit. That's a lot of electrical energy that has to be handled and routed uh, throughout the circuit. So every component, connector, resistor, and so on, needs to be you know, heavy duty construction to handle the, handle the current. Uh, and in fact, what we find is uh, oftentimes the circuitry is fine and dandy when the vehicle is new, but as the vehicle ages and the blow, you know, the blow motor ages, the bearings wear out, the drag increases, and then the current draw increases, and that's what calls the, causes the blow motor to fail. Now, another thing to keep in mind here is, uh, you know, oftentimes you'll turn the blower on high and on a hot day or a cold day right after you start the vehicle up for hot or, 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 or air conditioning. But the vast majority of the time, most blower motors on, 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 are on one of the low speeds. And the, so therefore the resistor, 90% of the time, the resistor is in the circuit modulating the blower speed. And the thing to keep in mind here, this little table shows you on a typical five-speed blower circuit, this table is showing you the amount of work being done by just the blower motor resistor. Remember, the resistor is really kind of a heat sink. It's, we're, we're dumping the waste uh, wattage or the waste heat energy that's not being used by the blow motor, we're using the resistor to dump that when the blow motor is not on high speed. And as you can see here on the lower speed, the, the resistor is doing almost 75%, almost three quarters of the work being done. Uh, on speed two, where, where a lot of folks run their uh, run the blow motor, you can see here that in, the resistor is still doing the lion's share of the electrical work in the circuit. So it's important to keep that in mind. And another th uh, quick thing to look at here is the blow motor resistor. Here we're doing this on the left, you see an infrared picture. You see it's almost it's 536 degrees. I've seen these blower resistors get up into the five, 600 degree range. That's a lot, and that's been heat cycles, you know, from 
maybe 20 below to five, 600 degrees over thousands of cycles, you can imagine that it takes a heavy duty component to last the life of the vehicle. Uh, another way to look at it is, uh, you know, a lot of tabletop, small tabletop, uh, portable microwaves, if you like, are typically between 300 and 400 watts. So in other words, you've got a component up onto the dash there that's typically between the resistor and the motor itself, is handling 300 watts of electrical energy. That's a lot of heat energy, electrical energy to be handled and dissipated uh, by the blower control circuit. And uh, that is why, I'm sure we've all seen this, a car comes in your shop, the connector at the blower motor, the blower resistor, the blower switch. Uh, you can see here, the, there's a lot of damage. There's a lot of damaged uh, circuitry here because that 350 watts of power takes a lot of you know, really good connections, heavy duty circuits, quality components to handle that 350 watts of power. So, uh, before we get into the waveform piece here, let's take a quick look at the, uh, you know, the evolution of blower motor technology. So down here on the left, uh, lower left, of course, is a traditional conventional brush type blower motor has been around as long as pretty much as long as the automobile has been around. Uh, you know, two wires power ground and you uh, brush type motor. And most of us are kind of sort of familiar with that. In the middle there is kind of an intermediate technology, what we would call pulse width modulated uh, brush type motor. It's still using brushes, conventional brushes, but instead of uh, routing the current through the voltage through a resistor to control blower speed, we literally turn the motor on and off very we turn the power or the ground on and off very rapidly to control the blower speed. Uh, it's more efficient, uh, produces less heat um, uh, energy than a, a traditional resistor type blower motor. But we're actually getting away from that now too. A lot of modern vehicles now have gone to brushless blower motor technology and we'll get deeper into that uh, further down the presentation. So let's look very quickly at brushed blower circuits. Again, I'm doing a little table setting here. We're not going to get deep, deep into the circuits, just giving you some quick perspectives and pointers when a vehicle comes in your shop and you're looking for some diagnostic direction on a blower motor circuit. So the first circuit up here is what we call a positive side control circuit, meaning that to control the blower speed, we are going to change, we're going to switch the voltage or change the voltage applied to the motor on the positive side of the motor. So this is kind of a pictorial representation. You can see that the blower motor is permanently grounded and the resistor is between the speed control switch and the blower. So we're going to control the voltage applied to the motor to control its speed. So you've probably all seen this. This is a very old, typical, it's been around for a good number of years, a typical GM blower control circuit. Uh, if you look up in the dash, there's probably a nine wire connector at the blower resistor. And you're looking at it and thinking, wow, there's a lot going on there. There's is a pretty complicated circuit. And uh, I, you know, it can be hard to know where to start when you come to diagnose a circuit like this. Just looking at the power off circumstance here, uh, you can see that there's two wires. There's just one wire coming to the um, to the to the uh, blower resistor that's actually hot under this environment. So if I turn the blower switch on low speed, and so here's the pointers I'm going to give you from a diagnostic perspective. What you want to do is not try to focus on the whole diagram at one time. We're just going to we are going to focus on just the circuits that are involved. Um, for the blower to run at the specific speed. So if I got a problem with speed number one, for example, I set the switch to the one position, as you can see here, I'm just going to look, I'm going to use, uh, you know, print up the wiring schematic, use some highlighters, you know, uh, uh, highlighters, and some of you have probably done this before, and I am just going to highlight the circuits like you've got in red here. I'm going to highlight the circuits that are involved in, that are directly involved in allowing this blow motor to run on slow speed. And you can see, the, uh, if you look over on the right there in the pinky purple, you can see that on low speed, the voltage has to come through R1, R2, R3, R4. It's got to come through all four resistors that are part of the blower motor resistor uh, assembly or block. If I click a speed two, now you see a, there's a different term, a circuit hot at the blower resistor. And again, uh, my cut to the chase here to get focused on what I need to do is I'm going to print out the schematic. I'm going to look at the blower switch and I'm going to select, depending on which circuit I'm interested in, I'm going to highlight the circuits from the blower switch, one, two, three, four, five or high. I'm going to just highlight those circuits that are involved in the particular circuit that I'm trying to diagnose of the moment. and 
ignore all the other circuits. Just highlight the circuits that are essential for the blower to work on that speed. So I'm working more here I'm on speed three, speed four, and you see I've bypassed more of the resistors in the resistor block. And finally, uh, when I switch to high speed, you see the terminal F there. Uh, terminal F comes hot at the, at the blower block, at the resistor block. Now it has energized the, uh, the coil and the relay and flipped it over from the resistor side to the full voltage supply from full system voltage applied directly, basically from the battery uh, through the relay. And uh, this is another, uh, it's worth pointing out here that this is kind of a unique GM uh, approach here. You don't often see this where the high speed blower relay is actually integral to uh, the blower resistor block, which makes it kind of, you know, from a diagnostic perspective, all these wires going back and forth, the relay is involved, it can make it a bit confusing to get a diagnostic handle on the circuit. So the other type of circuit again, and you know, I'm trying to get focused on how am I gonna go about diagnosing a problem with this blower circuit. It's important to understand from the outset, is it a positive side control circuit like we just looked at, or is it like a lot of Fords use, is it a ground side control circuit? So here you can see the blower motors powered up, it might be coming through a fuse or a relay or something of that nature, but the blower motor is getting full system voltage and the resistor is interjected, is in, inserted between the blower and the blower control switch and ground. So in, with this arrangement, I'm going to control the blower ground side circuit. And here, of course, again, I'm going to use my print out my schematic, use my highlighters and look at the blower switch. If I have a problem with low speed or medium speed, medium high and so on, I'm just going to focus on those circuits and highlight those circuits that are involved, that are directly involved, tracing them back from the switch, that are directly involved with getting the blower motor to work on a particular speed. This way, I highlight only the circuits that are involved in getting the thing to work. And that helps me unclose of my diagnostic uh, thinking and really get me focused on what I'm what the essential circuits to get this blower circuit to run. So here I'm going to click through. Now I'm on low speed. Uh, you, you can see it's coming through all the resistors here. If I trace out the circuit on the on the screen, you can see this this the, the blue and the red circuits, light blue, dark blue, these are the circuits that are directly involved in getting the blower to run at low speed if that was my problem. And here I've on, on speed, on the second speed into speed number two, I've bypassed the R3 there in the resistor block. Now I'm bypassing R2. And finally, uh, when, I, when I switch the switch over to high, uh, now I'm bypassing the resistor block completely. I am the, through the blower switch, I am directly grounding, I'm, grounding the blower motor directly. It's also worth pointing out here that when you turn the AC on or turn any switch on in the pretty much any switch in the blower and the HVAC control head, note that the resist that the HVAC control head, the transistor there that for this blower to work, the control head, the transistor and the control head must ground the coil of the blower relay in order for this blower circuit to work. So uh, uh, we, let's uh, pause here for just a minute and uh, see if anybody, any questions arising from our, our current uh, conversation? Yeah, two or... questions. And actually one of them I know you're going to get to, but when you talked about the different types of blower motors, brushed and brushless, so I said, can I convert from one to the other? Uh, you can, you know, on paper, depending on whether the control module is, I'll tell you, what, Ryan, I think I have a slide coming up that will address that. So okay. let me let me just pause right there and, and, and continue on. And on a high side or low side, ground or positive side, is the amount of current going through the switch or the resistor any different? No, it's it's going to the current flow in the circuit, whether it's on the power side or the ground side, the current flow is going to be the same throughout the circuit. The voltage will be different at different points along the circuit. We'll have voltage drops across the resistor and so on, but the actual volume of current flowing in the circuit will be the same throughout. That's perfect. Okay. All right. You have some great demos, so we'll get back to it. All right. Let's go go right ahead here. So we're going to look briefly here at some pulse width modulation, uh, which is quite common on, let's say, the, over the past 10, 15 years, is common, common on a lot of vehicles. The first example up here is the car we were standing in front of when we uh, did our introductions. It's the 20, the 20, the blue 2015 Chrysler 200 we have here at the training center. 
And of course, I want you to imagine for a moment, this car's in your shop with some kind of a blow motor, you know, it's not turning on at all. It's only working on, on, on some, some speeds, not all. And you pull up your wiring schematic and this is what you get. And the first diagnostic, you know, some of the circuits are pretty straightforward. We're not gonna dwell on them. The power supply, the ground and so on. I, mean, I think most everybody knows how to check a power on ground. Where the, di no, where the diagnostic confusion comes into the conversation is if I look at the what we're calling blow return, which is oddly a red wire, that's the ground circuit, the blow return and the blower supply. And we see that both the motor power and ground are both coming from the power control module. So obviously, you, you know, you're going to have a question in your mind, mm, I wonder what's going on on those circuits. So there's some diagnostic uncertainty there. And then over on the right hand side there of the, of the blow control module, you see there's a blower control circuit and front blower control. And that's exactly how they're named or titled in the factory wiring schematic. So, you know, sometimes the way a terminal or a circuit is described or named gives a great clue to how it supposed to work. There's really not a whole lot of evidence here from the, looking at the schematic as to what's going on so or, or how these circuits actually work. So I'm going to, in the next slide coming up, I'm going to look at some waveforms and we are going to look to see, we're going to focus on the power return, the blow return circuit, the blower supply circuit, and the blower control and front blower control circuits. They're the circuits we're going to look at to see, to understand how this uh, system, how this blower control is supposed to work. So here we're looking at a scope pattern. Uh, I'm going to, it's a live pattern. I will play it in just a moment, but before I do, let me describe what's going on here. The very top of the screen here, very, the red pattern on the very top, that is the duty cycle command. It's one of those control circuits coming from the HVAC control module to the power module. That is a duty cycle command to the power module telling it how fast to run the blower motor, right? And when we run the diagram or we'll run the video, watch that pattern, you'll see that it expands and then contracts as we go from low speed to high speed and back. The green pattern is blower current. And obviously if I increase the blower speed, I would expect right there, it's stopped at six amps. I'm gonna expect that to go up. It'll top out and then come back down again uh, as we increase the blower speed, and then we're going to dial the blower speed back down again. You should see the duty cycle expand and the current increase and decrease as we cycle the motor through all its up and down through all its speeds. Now the blue pattern looks kind of what's going on there. It looks all crushed up and scrunched up. Looks quite confusing. Um, and we're in our next. Uh, we're at a very long time base here. At our next slide, we'll take a closer look at that pattern and discuss what's going on there. On the bottom uh, slide, the 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 goldy colored uh, pattern there on the very bottom feedback signal that is an, another that is the feedback circuit from the blower motor uh, power module back to the HVAC module and what that's that signal is confirming back to the computer or the HVAC control module that the commanded speed is being met it's a confirmation signal if you like that the commanded speed is being met by the power module and so you should see that again as we watch the pattern here that volt should increase and decrease as we as we increase the blower speed so let me play the video and just watch it See the blower current going up, the red, the pulse width is expanding. And look, see the, the, brown, uh, the brown circuit there, how it came down? That, there's just noise on that circuit. That's just a straight line voltage. That voltage started low, went up as the speed went up and came back down. That's a feedback confirmation to the HVAC module that the blower speed changed as commanded. All right, uh, you might also, I'll play it one more time. You might also have noticed there, watch in the middle of the pattern, about the middle of the time frame here, Right there, you see how the pattern got all cleaned up. Or there was all the noise went away. And that's because the power module is supplying a full power and a full ground. There's no more pulse width modulation. It's just giving the motor a full power and ground. So all the electrical noise goes away. Now uh, here, these are the exact same signals. I've just zoomed in a little closer. And now we can see what's, you, you can watch the blue pattern here. This is the ground side of the blower motor. You can see that the ground, the on time at the ground side of the motor is going to increase as we play the pattern. So watch the current going up, watch that blue pattern, the ground 
amount. And there it goes full, there it went to full speed to full ground. So again, uh, this is what I would, you know, if I understanding how these circuits work, what they do and what you would expect to see, you know, will help you with your diagnostic insight on diagnosing one of these. The other thing I would point out here is that, um, uh, you know, you can, we're using a scope here, but you could certainly use a digital voltmeter, digital multimeter using the frequency and duty cycle features on a digital multimeter to, to you know, to, to do your diagnostic as well. You can also look at the schematic and the circuit, of course, with the scan tool. Uh, on the top is the command to the power module. On the bottom is the feed, the voltage, the feedback voltage. I would point out here that the feedback, remember the feedback voltage in the previous uh, scope pattern never got above eight volts, yet the scan tool is showing that it's getting to 13 and a half volts. Again, scan data, absolutely, I'm going to use it as a tool, but it can be unreliable and can, can point you in the right direction does nothing better than getting down on the circuit with a scope or a meter to, to check it directly. So uh, another word of caution, this comes to, to the question that came in. Uh, we are often asked, uh, you know, there is a trend out there. It is possible there are pulse width modulated motors available to replace brushless motors. They're a lot cheaper. The problem I have with that, the concern I have with that is this is the close up of the pigtail connector on the 2015 Chrysler, which uses a pulse width modulated control circuit. What I want you to note here is that the wires, the power on the ground for the motor is like a twisted pair. Think of a network connection. We twist the wires together to eliminate or to reduce electrical interference. And also note that it's a braided, it's like a, got a coax or a braided grounded sheathing on the outside of the wires. And what that tells me, what they're trying to do here is they're trying to suppress, reduce the electrical interference associated with this type of design with pulse width modulation design to uh, reduce electrical interference under the dash and with com communication circuits. So uh, that's the concern I have. If you introduce a pulse width modulated motor under a dash where the circuitry and the sheathing is not there to, it's not designed for it, you could run into all kinds of communication problems, false trouble codes and that kind of issues of that nature. So let's jump in here to some brushless motors. Uh, as I said, brushless has become the technology du jour, if you want to call it that. A lot of fuel pumps, uh, cooling fans, a lot of rotating electrical now is going to this brushless technology. They are lighter. They're, you can put, get the same job done in a smaller package because you've eliminated the the, the the segment section of the armature and the brush, the whole brush head and so on. Uh, you can control it over a much wider speed. There's less electrical noise because you don't have the arcing at the brushes and less mechanical noise because you don't have the rubbing of the brushes involved. More efficient, quieter, greater speed range. Uh, it's just all around a much more efficient uh, design. So if I look at a DC motor, uh, I put power on what to one armature or one segment of the armature and I put ground on the other I'm going to produce a magnetic field in those in the winding here and the winding here that magnetic field interacts with the north south magnets that are stationary around the outside and so the, the magnets resist or bounce off each other and that causes the rotor to turn it turns to a new segment energize a new set of windings and off that's what starts the motor turning on a brushless motor, uh, note that we don't, no brushes. Uh, the magnets can be on a central rotor or they can be on an outer uh, rotating element. Or we call that in runner or out runner. And the way we control the speed and get the motor started was this electronics package here. You see, there's a series of switches here. So if I energize this solenoid here uh, and I ground it through here, that will create a magnetic field, which will interact with the magnetic field and the outer rotor and that will nudge the motor. Now, to, of course, to get the motor started, the computer needs to know, the electronic circuit needs to know where the motor is at. And it does that by send, sending a pulse through any one of the windings or all of the windings. And it notes the, you know, depending on the position of the magnets relative to the windings, you get a different feedback, uh, back flyback voltage from the different, from the windings. And that kind of tells 
tells the, the, the electronic circuitry the position of the motor so it knows which winding to energize first to get the motor started turning. And then by rotating the electronics, by rotating the magnetic field around the rotor, uh, we can make the, we can speed the rotor up or slow the rotor down. So that's how a blow motor actually starts. So what we're going to do here very quickly is um, we're going to look at uh, we're going to look at an actual I uh, got a couple laid out on the bench here. And so here's my traditional blow motor. Uh, uh, here's the, 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 the rotor. You can see here's my brush segments here. And I've got a central winding. If I put voltage here, voltage here, these two segments are going to be connected through the coil. If I put voltage here, grounded here, going to create a magnetic field, let's say, in this winding. That's going to interact with the magnets in the outer shell here. There's uh, two stationary magnets here. The motor will nudge in one direction or the other, and then it moves on to the second segment, new magnetic field, and it just, that's how we get the motor started turning. On a brushless motor, of course, there are no brushes. The first thing you notice, in, a, in an in runner, out runner, this is an out runner, the magnets are on the outer, on the outer rotating part of the motor. The first thing you notice is if I turn it here, look at it, it just how smooth, it just, there's virtually no friction, very efficient operation. I've got, it's a three phase motor, one, two, three phases. I energize, energize these windings in different permutations. And then I just use an electronic circuit on the, uh, you know, that's mounted on the back of the motor here. Here's the power for the three phases of the winding and the electronic circuitry senses where the rotor is at and then switches the windings, uh, you know, keeps rotating the magnetic field around the rotor to keep the, to speed the rotor up or slow the rotor down. So that's kind of a very quick picture of what's going on on the, um, uh, on the, uh, the difference between a, a DC and a, uh, DC and a brushless type, brush type and brush type motor. So uh, we, we did that. And so here's a typical schematic here from uh, a, uh, this is from a 2020 Chevy or Equinox, as I recall. And you can see it's a very simple looking circuit of just at the blower control module, at the blower motor itself, I've got three wires, power, simple straight power, simple straight ground. And then the third circuit, of course, is a speed control command circuit, right? It's got no feedback. The module has no way of knowing how fast the motor, it just, it does its thing to control the speed depending on the command coming in. And so uh, this is what the, the, you can see here, here's the current, the blue pattern is the current, the green uh, pattern is the duty cycle command. If I increase or decrease that pulse, that pulse width there, I can increase or decrease the speed of the motor. So uh, on a more sophisticated vehicle, so this is from a 2010 Cadillac uh, CT4, and you can see the same power ground. Here's the motor assembly here. I've got power, I've got ground, but now I've got an extra circuit. I've got the same speed control command circuit. So I'm gonna increase, decrease the duty cycle on that circuit to increase or decrease the blower motor speed. But I've also got a bit like the Chrysler we looked at before, I do have a speed control feedback. In other words, I've got a circuit going back to the HVAC module, telling the module that the, that the speed, that the commanded speed is being achieved. So here is, um, and here is the, here's the blower speed command signal. Uh, very long time base here, blow the feedback signal. And here I'm stepping the motor speed up from low speed to high speed. You can see the blue pattern is the current. You can see the current increasing and decreasing as I increase and decrease the blower speed. And if I look, uh, here's the blower command pattern in red, the feedback signal in green. And uh, the, the difference I would, the point, the difference if you're diagnosing one of these, the key thing I want to point out is, the blower command is going to be pulse width modulated. The, the command will, the, the, the on time versus off time will change as the speed command changes. But the feedback signal is strictly uh, frequency. The frequency of the feedback signal will increase or decrease as the speed of the motor changes. So uh, over here, folks, we have a nice, uh, we've got a blower um, uh, we've got a demonstration board here, and I've got uh, a, a good motor with no problems. This is the one on the end here, and um, we can actually, I'm gonna, we're, we're going to look at some of the, pat and some of these other uh, ones here actually have issues. So I can, I've got it all powered up. I can clip my here, and I can run the, this one here, and now I can 
run this one here. So we are gonna run these motors and look at some of the patterns and get some insights into what's going on in the circuit. The other thing I would ask you to note here is I've got two current probes and I'll explain why I'm using, there's two current, two identical current probes on the same wire at the same time. And we will explain in one moment uh, why, um, uh, why we're, uh, why we're, uh, why we are using two current probes here. So um, uh, to do this, I'm going to pull up a uh, an oscilloscope wave pattern here, and we're going to start off with we'll start off with a uh, an, a good motor, a known good motor, and um, you can see looking at my pattern, you can see there's. Um, And then I go to the, to the green pattern here. And you can see that one pattern, so there's two things that I want to know about a blow motor circuit. I want to know how much current it's actually using. Okay, and that's going to be on the blue pattern here. I want to know how much current it's actually using. And, you know, because if it's drawing more current than I would expect it to draw, then, um, and I'm going to pause the pattern here and we'll stop the motor so we can hear ourselves, so we can hear ourselves think. The two things I want to know is how much current is the motor uh, using? Because uh, if it's drawing excess current, it's going to burn out my resistor, it's going to burn out pigtails and so on and so forth. And the other thing is if this car is in my shop for an intermittent blower operation, then I'd have concern about, um, you know, could there be a future problem? For example, if I'm going to take the dash out of the vehicle for actuator replacement or heater core replacement, if I'm going to work on the dash here or the customer's complaining about an intermittent blower problem, I would want to know how much current the motor is drawing. And the other thing I'm going to want to look at here is, um, uh, the other thing I want to look at is, uh, what, what does the pattern look like? So, in other words, is there anything abnormal about the the ripple? So to get a handle on that, I am going to uh, I'm going to show you another pattern here very quickly, and I believe that will be number new one two three. Yeah, this one I like this one here. And I'm going to go live on this pattern. And again, I, I, I'm running the motor. You can probably hear it. I'm going to pause the pattern. I'm going to disconnect the motor. Whoop. I'm going to disconnect the motor. And again, I'm looking at the AC current on the on the top pattern. I'm looking at the DC current on the, on the bottom pattern. The bottom pattern enables me to see how much total current the blow motor is using. Is it is it is it more or less than what I typically see on this same vehicle, same application? The top pattern, uh, by putting it by AC coupling the pattern, I can go on to a much smaller uh, amperage scale and get a very close look at the motor. So if I pull out some cursors here, I lay this one here like this. I will lay this one here like this, and so you can see this pattern. It's got a I can easily see each revolution of the motor because there's a very unique, uh, you know, the, the the signature, the pattern has a unique signature that I can easily recognize in the pattern. And by laying the cursors here, you, you can do this, uh, the time between the cursors, divide that into 60,000 milliseconds, which is the number of milliseconds in, in a minute. Uh, you could do the math yourself, but uh, PicoScope has very kindly uh, calculated here that this blower motor is running at about 6,000 RPM, which is, you know, it's remember now it's freewheeling and fresh air here. It's not in the dash under any kind of resistance. So uh, you, the, the point I'm making here, this blower motor runs, the customer complaint on this vehicle was intermittent blower operation. Of course, that could be bad. There's a million things that could be, bad connection and so on. But by looking at the blower motor current pattern here, right off the bat, I can see there's, a, there's an aberration here. Uh, there's a problem with one of the segments on the armature on this blower motor as evidenced by the red, the, the, the spike on the red pattern here. So 
this is how I'm going to use a blow motor, uh, looking at blow motor current and voltage patterns to figure out is there something I need to be concerned about on the vehicle. So I'm going to get back to our presentation here. And we're going to uh, uh, give you some quick, to, to finish the session, we're going to look at some quick diagnostic uh, installation quick tips. Uh, of course, what the object of the exercise here is to prevent uh, a comeback. You know, I'm sure we've all had this experience. I certainly have where you replace a blower motor, replace a resistor, replace something in the blower circuit, and the vehicle comes back a week or months later with a repeat failure. So obviously, as I just explained and demonstrated, you want to check a blow motor current draw. Is it, you know, especially, is it more than you would expect to see for that particular application from your experience? And uh, again, I use uh, two amp probes oftentimes for speed. Uh, and I look at AC coupled on one, DC coupled on the other. And uh, quick tips here. If the blower current is higher than I would expect for this application, and the, the current draw is higher, but the blower speed is lower than I would expect to see, then uh, one of the things, of course, it could be a bad motor, but one of the things to look at is, uh, this picture's from an F-150 here, if the, if the evaporator is all covered over with some kind of debris uh, and so on, like you see in the picture here, that means restricted airflow through the evaporator. The blower motor is pushing up against that restriction. So it's going to take more current to drive the motor and it will be slower. So the current will be high, speed will be low. And I have seen this cause repeat resistor failure over time. Uh, the counterpoint to that is if you've got a clogged, uh, a clogged cabin filter, that's going to be upstream of the blower motor. That will cause cavitation at the blower motor. So in fact, you're... Um, your current would be lower than expected, but the speed would be higher. If that's the case, I would suspect a clogged cabin air filter. Um, and one quick tip here, if you do are changing a cabin air filter, a lot of blower motors are easy to pop out. I recommend popping out the blower motor uh, to avoid, the, before you replace it, before you pull out the filter to avoid the debris falling into the motor. Uh, the evaporator case drain, I've seen this over the years where water, you know, the, the squirrel cage catches the water built up in the case, splashes it up, it ingests it into the motor, splashes it up on that 600 degree uh, resistor uh, element and cracks the resistor, it leads to repeat resistor failure. And, you know, as I've explained, this is a 300, 400, you know, two, three, three, 350 watt circuit, uh, oftentimes, the real fix is to you know replace the blow resistor pigtail with the heavy duty replacement piece. Uh, check for cage binding. Over years, the dash gets hot. Uh, the dash can sag. I've seen the blow cage, the squirrel cage, the squirrel wheel, you know, start contacting the HVAC case because the whole plastic, especially on bigger trucks, big long dashes. I've seen the blower cage start you know interfering with the dash. Uh, impact of a bad splice, I see this, we get a lot of calls here in our tech line uh, where the ultimate problem turns out to be a bad connection. You can see here, there's a splice on the left, infrared picture, it's 283 degrees. There's the actual picture on the right. If we do a voltage drop across that splice, guess what? There's a almost a five volt drop across that bad splice. So making a good splice is actually, uh, you know, can it over simple, you know, repair one, two, three, A, B, C, but oftentimes the number of times we trace a problem back to a bad splice is pretty quick. There's a quick Ford quick tip here. Uh, car comes in your shop, truck comes in your shop, uh, poor AC performance, head pressure 350 PSI or above. If the low speed on the blower circuit is burned out, the very lowest speed is burned out, oftentimes the compressor will run, but you've got no airflow through the evaporator. The TXV valve closes up all the way. The low speed, the low side of the system goes into a vacuum and uh, overnight then it draws air into the front seat of the compressor. You, you do a recovery cycle recharge, the customer takes the car, comes back two, three weeks later with the same problem. And the fix of course is the, the problem is one circuit, usually the low speed in the blower circuit is burned out in the, in the card, the resistor card, and the fix typically, you know, check the blower motor current, but you'll certainly need to replace the resistor and oftentimes the motor and the pigtail connector as well. So um, the next thing I wanna talk about here, we're gonna wrap, wrap it up uh, is, um, we're going to wrap it up with a quick uh, tool review here. You know, I referenced making a bad splice before. 
uh, here, uh, you know, here's what the tool that I see, 80% of the guys I see working on electrical, this is the kind of splicing tool they use. This tool, it squishes the connector. It's, you know, it's sheet, it's almost sheet metal. It's not very robust. If you want a good crimp, a quality crimp, you need a tool with wide jaws here. Uh, and that encapsulates the connector, you get a much more electrically effective, a much more powerful crimp. The other thing I would point out is that uh, connectors, uh, you know, you, you've seen the straight blue connector, same gauge wire on either end. They make step down connectors, uh, step down butt connectors, and that is for joining. If I'm, you know, oftentimes we would supply a heavy duty, high temperature replacement uh, pigtail and you're matching that up to the harness wiring and so you will need to uh, make two different gauge wires so what i suggest there is either use a step down connector like i just showed you or if you're using a straight through butt connector don't forget the the, the, the lesser gauge wire fold over the end of it so that you get a proper fill you know it fits properly and snugly in the end of the connector, so you get a much more effective splice. Finally, um, I see a lot of guys using a, a cigarette lighter, a torch of some nature to, you know, to if you're if you're using a you know if you're using a uh, insulation free or no one no insulation type of butt connector, which I actually prefer. Uh, oftentimes, I see guys using a cigarette lighter or an open flame to 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 shrink the tubing. I much prefer to use a heat gun with a deflector tip for shrinking heat tubing. So um, with that, folks, I hope you got a few tips out of our session. Thank you very much for spending the half hour plus with us. And I'll turn it back to Ryan. We got the bonus session here. And so thank you, Peter. A lot of great information. Uh, if you're looking for more information or some of Peter's additional tips, you can always find them on any of our YouTube channels, such as our Four Seasons YouTube channel or Standard Brand YouTube channel. Uh, if you're looking for more information like this, reach out to your local parts store and sign up for one of our classes. We've got a great HVAC class uh, that we offer every single year here. So we appreciate you coming today. Look forward to seeing you at the next Power Hour. We'll be doing Ignition Systems in December. Uh, sign up for our SMP Connections newsletter. It comes out monthly now. And we're going to leave you with the number to our temp control tech line. That's actually housed here in the training center. And uh, we've got operators standing by ready to take your questions either in Spanish or in English. Thanks for tuning in today. Have a, have a great afternoon of wrenching. Thank you very much. Take care.